During the Iraq War, a prison used to house the political prisoners of Saddam Hussein was repurposed by the CIA and the United States Army. It was turned into a military prison, which would hold those suspected of being leaders of insurgency forces, high-value captives of the previous regime, as well as those who committed crimes against the occupying forces. It would soon become host to violations of human rights, SA, and torture. Photographs showing soldiers posing with the inmates in degrading positions and even with corpses. The photographs were soon released to the public, causing a massive response. Abu Ghraib prison was in operation as a military prison for captured Iraqis from early 2003 until August of 2006, holding as many as 4,000 prisoners at a time. In early 2003, the number of insurgent attacks against American forces had increased, resulting in many dead American soldiers and Iraqi civilians. Intelligence and information were desperately needed about the insurgent forces, and so the Americans utilized what are called enhanced interrogation techniques on those suspected of being insurgents. Enhanced interrogation is just another word for torture. In the previous years, the Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld, had authorized the use of 16 such techniques at Guantanamo Bay Prison. These included hooding, stress positions, isolation, stripping, deprivation of light, removal of religious items, and the use of dogs all to extract information. These techniques, which would violate the Geneva Conventions, would be carried over and employed against the inmates in the Abu Ghraib prison. An example of the consequences of such a policy can be seen in November of 2003, when an inmate named Manadel Al-Jamari was killed following an interrogation. Al-Jamari had been captured on suspicion of being responsible for a bombing on a Red Cross facility. Reports first start with a Navy SEAL and CIA team that had captured Al Jamari, taking turns beating him whilst he was held at the Baghdad airport. He was interrogated at gunpoint and made to believe he had been doused in petrol with a threat of being set alight if he did not provide information. Upon arrival at Abu Ghraib, Al Jamari was not put on the prison registers, meaning he was never officially there. He was deemed a ghost, giving him a precarious status of the fear that he may have disappeared. He was subject to Palestinian hanging, a form of torture where the victim's hands are tied behind their backs before being suspended by a rope attached at the wrists. Such a position puts immense strain on a person's lungs, and being held in such a way can result in death. Within the hour, Al Jamadi's corpse was taken down and blood pouring from his mouth with his arms barely in their sockets. The body was kept in a shower block overnight, whilst it was decided what would be done. The next day, Al Jamadi's corpse was removed from the prison in such a way as to make him look ill rather than dead. His body was fitted with an intravenous, with a dispute soon emerging between the various branches of the military as to who would take responsibility and deal with the corpse. Before all of this, however, a number of guards took photographs with the corpse, smiling with their thumbs up. It was even reported that guards subsequently referred to Al Jamari as Bernie, in reference to the weekend at Bernie's comedy film, where a dead body is carried around by the protagonist to keep up the pretense of still being alive. Another infamous instance involved Ali Shalal Al Kazi. Al Qazi owned a football pitch in Baghdad, but shortly after the invasion of Iraq in March of 2003, his football pitch had been appropriated by the US forces. The pitch was used as a dumping ground for military waste, rubble from attacks, and according to Al Qazi, even used for dumping severed body parts. In response, Al Qazi contacted the foreign press and broke the story of what was happening. His photograph was published along with his complaints, but in response, his home was raided by the American army and he was detained. Al Qazi was first held in a detention center in his neighborhood for interrogation, but he was soon transferred to Abu Ghraib prison. During his time at Abu Ghraib, Al Qazi recalls being forced to stand on a box with a bag over his head. He was then attached with electrical wires which would cause him to be electrocuted if he moved in any way. Photographs were taken of this torture, with the man in the hood 
being one of the main photographs associated with what was happening at Abu Ghraib. These are but two accounts of just two of the prisoners of Abu Ghraib, though there are many more. It was commonplace for torture and SA to be carried out on the inmates. The prisoners also reported hearing the sounds of women screaming at night as the guards forced themselves upon them. Many inmates were subjected to humiliation, including being made to form human pyramids, made to pleasure themselves in front of guards, and made to eat pork or drink alcohol, which would go against their religious beliefs. It was in January of 2004 that Sergeant Joseph Darby blew the whistle on what was happening at Abu Ghraib prison. He had been given CD-ROMs by another soldier named Charles Garner. Some of the photographs included naked prisoners covered in excrement, bound on the floor whilst being beaten and being kept on a leash. Many of the photographs included serious SA. It was also clear that some of the soldiers enjoyed inflicting the tortures upon the prisoners, as grins could be seen etched across their faces. In response to the photographs provided, the army investigated the prison. The photographs were soon made available to the press. The United States government initially refused to release the photographs under a Freedom of Information Act request, as they were deemed to show soldiers acting in such egregious ways. The government argued against the release of the photographs, stating that it would cause a national security risk as it would undermine their efforts in Iraq. This was dismissed by the courts, with the judge quoting President Bush's own State of Union address that stressed the importance of democracy. It is perhaps also interesting to note that Darby had requested that he remain anonymous when provided the photographs and videos of what happened. However, Donald Rumsfeld had leaked Darby's name at a Senate hearing. Darby and his family were subject to vandalism and had threats made against their lives, resulting in the family moving into protective measure. In total, 11 of the soldiers at Abu Ghraib were convicted by military courts, with crimes ranging from conspiracy to mistreat inmates to committing indecent acts. The man with the moustache that is seen in many of the photographs was named Charles Garner. He was sentenced to six and a half years in prison for his crimes. What is very interesting about Charles Garner is that he claimed his superiors knew exactly what was happening at Abu Ghraib and that they tolerated it. He even stated that he had beaten a detainee to near death in the presence of a military intelligence officer without any reprimand. In fact, Ghana claimed to have been so brazen with handling the photographs and videos to Darby as he understood the treatment of the inmates was common knowledge and was approved by the leadership. Charles Ghana would go on to marry Megan Amble, the woman photographed with a prisoner tied on a leash. Some have seen the treatment of officers and those in command as preferential. For example, Private Ivan Frederick, pictured sitting here whilst an inmate is held in a stress position, said he had consulted with six officers, with ranks from captain to lieutenant colonel, about the guard's actions, but was never told to stop what was being done or that it was wrong in any way. At the court cases of the soldiers, not a single officer was called to testify. However, in 2005, Colonel Thomas Pappas was reprimanded and fined $8,000. He was the officer in charge of Abu Ghraib's prison intelligence unit whilst the worst of the crimes were occurring. An army investigation found Thomas had failed to properly train soldiers in interrogation techniques and that he had failed to obtain the proper permission to use working guard dogs whilst questioning Iraqi detainees. This was not a criminal nor a judicial charge and relates more to the procedural issues rather than the torture itself. A report by the Red Cross estimated that as many as 70% of the inmates were detained in error and were not part of the insurgency. One example referred to in one of the guard's letters home makes reference to a taxi cab driver who inadvertently had driven insurgents to their target. Such people were not able to provide the information that was required. In the bid to obtain information at the desperate time of the conflict, it was deemed acceptable by the American forces to detain many people and subject them to torture in a brazen breach of human rights and Geneva Conventions. There are countless photographs on the internet that are too disturbing for the likes of YouTube, but if you do wish to see them, they are just a Google search away. I will also be linking a Human Rights Watch report detailing the events for those of you who want to investigate this dark part of the war on terror.